This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by The Fitness Buff Show, the leanest, fastest hour on radio. Check it out online at fitnessbuffshow.com and start getting fitter and faster today. Mort Walker is the dean, and in some ways the curator, of American cartoonists. Best known for his long-running strips Beetle Bailey and High and Lois, Walker, 84, is also a bedrock member of the National Cartoonist Society, and he is the founder and energy behind the National Cartoon Museum. This is the third time I've had the pleasure of Mort's company over the last 20 years. I enjoy interviewing him because he says what's on his mind, and what's on his mind is never dull. But just in case my questions aren't as sharp enough for this American comic strip master, I've called in reinforcements. Ray Billingsley, creator of the Curtis Strip and an old friend of Walker's, kindly contributed questions today. So did a newer member of the fraternity, Mark Tatuli, creator of the Heart of the City and America's fastest growing new strip, Leo. Mort, welcome to Mr. Media. Good morning. Did I get your age right? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Sorry, should I not have brought that up? <laughs> It always sounds old to me, but I guess I ha- I'll have to get used to it. No, I don't think you ever have to get used to it. As long as you don't act that, that way, uh, I don't well, think I it's don't an actually, issue. They call me the Energizer Bunny around here. I, can't, I, I can wake up in the morning and I say, hey, I've got an idea. And they say, oh, God, not another idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boys are probably waiting for you to slow down a little bit. Yeah, well, I hope I never do. <laughs> well, I want to ask you about that. I mean, before we get to the questions from Mark and, and Ray, I'd like to hear about how you spend your days at the studio. Um, what's your level of involvement with your strips, I mean, alongside your sons and, and of course, uh, uh, your late partner, Dick Brown's boys? Well, one thing, I, uh, you have to start with an idea, so I'm always doing ideas. At breakfast, I, I usually get two or three gags. I have to have my pad with me, my clipboard with me all the time. Yesterday, my wife had to go to the doctor, and I went with her, and I was sitting in the waiting room, and she was in getting an MRI for an hour. I got 19 gags <laughs> while I was waiting for her. So, you know, you never really waste any time. Does and then I then I get back and uh, start doing my strips. I, I do all the penciling on the strips, and my son Greg does the inking. And uh, I usually can get those done in the morning. So, um, you know, my my work doesn't take me an awful lot of time, but so that gets me involved in a lot of other things. I got a brand new business I started. Oh, what's that? It's a magazine. It's called Mort Walker's The Best of Times. Hmm. And I I got started because we have a lot of weekly magazines and newspapers around here, and I usually pick them up there uh, at the exit of the grocery store, the delicatessen, or you know, wherever you're in, and they're piled up in a corner somewhere. And I looked at them, and I said, they really don't have much in them that's very interesting. Most of it is a repeat of what's in the daily newspaper. So all of a sudden I thought, you know, my paper here in Stamford, Connecticut, only uses about 10 of the King Features features. The King Features is the largest syndicate in the world. They syndicate all over the world. And they have 140 features that they syndicate. And my local paper, as I said, only uses 10 of them. That leaves 130 features that are available. And they're all famous writers and cartoonists and puzzle writers and so forth. And uh, so I thought I could put out a great newspaper using all the excess that the local paper doesn't use. And so I started this newspaper, or it started the, the magazine. It started as a newspaper, now it's a magazine. And it's uh, full color, there are 40 pages, and we sell advertising to make money. Wow. Doesn't so s- each, each issue brings in about $20,000, so <laughs> think, well, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something you could uh, spread out around the country, too. Yeah, and King Features puts it all together for me. I just tell them where the ads go, and they, they put it together for me. Yeah, you don't sound like a guy who has any intention of slowing down. No, I thought up a new comic strip yesterday morning, and I haven't even got anybody to look at it yet. <laughs> it's any good. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I did about fifteen gags for it, and uh, and I'm still waiting for you know my editors. <laughs> you know, I have a son that works with me here in the office, and 
His name is Neil. He also does all my drawings for the foreign markets. Mm. I give him the gags, and he does the drawings. They print them in. Beatles, the number one comic book in Scandinavia, and uh, they just can't get enough work. They mm. just uh, they reprint everything I've got, and they need uh, at least that much more to fill up the, the comic books. So I have to have somebody working on those things all the time. So you you came up with a new strip idea. What, how different would a, a strip by you be today than it was 40 or 50 years ago? Uh, I don't know. Um, I just sort of do what I like you know, <laughs> and wait and see if anybody else likes it. So, you know, I don't know that this is ever going to come to fruition because I, it seems like I'm always thinking I've, I've got about 10 comic strip ideas in my drawer right now that have either been rejected by me or rejected by the syndicates. So. Now, that, that, now, the young guys who are going to hear this interview are going to be shocked that a guy with your experience still gets rejections from the syndicate. Yeah, I, I took some stuff into the syndicate a few years ago, and the editor says, Mort, we got enough of your stuff. <laughs> and I says, yeah, but look at my stuff. is the stuff that's selling, you know, Beetle, High and Lois. Uh, you take Blondie and Hagar the Horrible, which I worked on, and um, you know, those are the top selling strips they've got. And all the new ones that they try uh, last for maybe a year or two, and then they die. I said, why don't you go along with my stuff? Well, they look at my age and they think, well, how many how many more years can <laughs> do we have for you? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I can't stop it though. Well, what hope is there for for a, a, a new cartoonist coming up? Uh, if uh, if an experienced veteran like yourself can't get a new strip going, well, you know, look at a strip called Zits. You know, that's that's a brand new strip, and boy, it's going great, guys. It's really I like it very much. Mm-hmm. Very well drawn, and uh, gags are good. Everything. So, you know, if you got the stuff, you'll you'll make it. What do you? Uh, well, let's. You know, I wasn't going to go that way right now, but that was something Ray wanted me to ask you about. What do you think of the direction? Uh, the, the present day cartoonists are headed and are there any particular strips that you uh, that you like right now well there are a lot of them I like but I guess about half of them I don't and usually it's because they're hard to read I don't get the gags uh, the drawing is confusing or it's something that I'm not that interested in you know? uh, I think a lot of them make the mistake of uh, doing gags about uh, animals or robots or something like that, you know, or, or bugs. <laughs> or, you know, people are interested in people. Mm-hmm. And I try to create characters that everybody can relate to. Everybody knows a Beetle Bailey. Everybody knows a Sarge. Everybody knows a General Half-Track or Miss Buxley, you know. And it's funny how often in my fan mail, everybody, like yesterday, I got a letter and somebody said, your favorite character is Cosmo. Can you send me a picture of Cosmo? And I'm thinking... Cosmo, I don't use him maybe once a month. <laughs> so, I don't know. It, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned Zitz. Are there others that you like particularly? Well, of course, Hagar is one of my, one of my favorites, and uh, Mother Goose and Grimm. Always get a laugh out of that. Um, well, I, I hate to start on all my favorites because I got a lot of them. All right. Well, well let me ask you about a couple of them specifically. Uh, what about Get Fuzzy? Is that one of the ones that you thought you mentioned animals? I'm guessing maybe that that's one that you're not so crazy about. I read it, uh, you know, about half the time, and I don't get that much out of it. I know a lot of people like it, and when I uh, argue with people about it, why well, they just say, "Oh, you just don't get it." So I think that there's a an appeal level that uh, some people have for certain strips. Uh, the, you know, that I don't have or other people don't have. It's just a, it's an individual thing. Um, what about uh, Pearls Before Swine? That's a very different strip, generationally speaking. Yeah, I read it, and, uh, you know, a lot of times I get a laugh out of it. Um, I find it a little confusing, and uh, I don't relate to it as well as I do a strip like this. You know, I, I, I have... I have uh, all... Altogether, we have 10 children. We've had a second marriage for both of us. Mm. And we have 15 grandchildren. And uh, I can see all my children in that strip. You know, that's the way they act. And uh, it's 
it's amusing to me the way they treat their parents and everything. So, uh, you know, I can relate to it. Does it bother you in Pearls uh, that the, uh, the sometimes the attacks on, uh, like, Family Circus, for example, or other strips, does that bother you or do, does that amuse you? I don't think it's an attack, you, you know, because he's used uh, Beetle Bailey in his uh, strip. I never, I always write him and thank him. <laughs> <laughs> What about that? And Mark Titulis is one of the things he, he had wanted me to ask you. He wondered if you had ever read Leo and, and what you thought of it. I don't see it. Oh, you don't? It's not, I, I get three papers every day, and uh, it's not in any one of those, and I just I've, I don't know that I've ever seen it. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, Mark will be disappointed, but I appreciate you being honest <laughs> about it. Well, I'll, I'll look for it, you know. It's just... Uh, uh, I just got back from Ohio. It wasn't in that paper. So I, I just don't know. It's okay. Well, let me ask you about something that's pretty close to your heart, and then we'll move on to some of the questions that Ray had for you. Uh, since the uh, Cartoon Museum closed in Boca, uh, Boca Raton, a few years ago, I know you've devoted a great deal of time and energy and money, for that matter, to finding a new home. The last time we spoke, which was probably about three years ago, maybe four, it looked like you were heading towards the Empire State Building, and I was wondering if you could kind of update us on, on, on what the status of the project is. Well, we got killed there, and, you know, it was very unfair. We had a contract uh, to go to the Empire State Building, and uh, as a result of the contract, we went out and we hired a staff of people and fundraisers, and we spent about half a million dollars, you know, preparing to move in there, and suddenly we got a, a notice from uh, the owner uh, who I'd been dealing with, that uh, they couldn't, uh, they had to cancel the contract. Mm. And because they have another attraction on the second floor called Sky Ride, which is a simulated helicopter ride over Manhattan. Okay. And they sell their tickets. And they were going to sell our tickets, you know. Uh, instead of rent, we would split the profits. They figured that each one of us, they'd make three and a half million, and we'd make three and a half million. And I said, Boris, no more fundraising for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a perfect deal, I thought. And the Skyride people said, we don't want the competition. If you sell the museum tickets, we'll sue you. <laughs> and so they canceled our contract, and they said, but we'll give you a cut rate in the rent. And we say we'll only charge you eight hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in rent, <laughs> <laughs> and we just that that just killed all of our uh, sponsors, all the people who are going to give us money. Mm -hmm. They just figured we'd never make it, and so you know we're out of business. And not only that, but they kept our one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars in security deposit. <laughs> you must have been crushed when that fell uh, apart. Well, it just killed us. You know, we we got had no more. People are going to give us money and no place to go. And uh, I, I had left the museum four hundred thousand dollars, and uh, I just couldn't go on doing that. Wow! And so, where is the where does the project stand now? Is there anything you well, can tell us? We have a, a new home for it, but I can't announce it yet. Okay, but it it it's there is something in the works. Yes. Okay. Do you know when you you might have something to reveal? Um. They're supposed to have a meeting on the 15th to uh, discuss it, and uh, we've looked at the new headquarters, which are beautiful, and uh, we haven't had a board meeting on it yet, mm. so that's the reason they told me not to announce it. <laughs> okay, I understand. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, let, let's go to some of the questions that Ray Billingsley had. You guys have known each other a long time. and uh, yeah, He used to hang out when he was a kid. He used to hang out at the museum. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Oh, so you do go back a ways with oh, him. Yeah, he was uh, he's just a teenager, and he was a very talented young man and very nice and everything. And we, we formed a friendship, and we've uh, been together. I've, I've made speeches in his behalf and so forth. And, uh, he's a very nice guy. It was actually Ray sent me a, an email and said, you've got to talk to Mort for Mr. <laughs> Media. So I said, you know. Ray, Ray's, uh, Ray's interview is actually one of the most popular that uh, that's ever run on uh, the Mr. Media site, so I, I have to bow to his advice on this. So one of the things that Ray wanted to know, though, was who was your first influence as a cartoonist? Well, I think uh, that it was probably Moon Mullins, uh, Frank Willard, who was a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And 
we used to get the Sunday paper on the front porch, and my father would ask me to go down and get it, and I'd bring it back, and I'd get in bed with him, and he'd read the funnies to me. And when he read Moon Mullins, he started to laugh until tears came down his cheeks, and I just got the biggest kick out of that, you know, seeing somebody laugh like that. And I can re- even remember specific strips that he <laughs> read to me. <clears throat> and uh, I think it influenced me and influenced my, uh, <clears throat> my style of humor and uh, the characterizations and everything. I, I think that uh, uh, that was my earliest influence. So you think you've always been trying to work to make your dad laugh? Yeah. Well, that's a nice thing to do for people. In fact, I do it all the time anyway. I, I go out, I go to the grocery store, for instance, and uh, I, Kathy goes down one aisle, I go down another aisle, and then I can't find her again. And I'm <laughs> looking around, the manager comes up and says, uh, can I help you? What are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for my wife. Said, what, what aisle do you keep wives in? <laughs> you know, and my wife says, can't you ever go out without make, trying to make everybody laugh? <laughs> <laughs> or trying to develop material for a strip. Yeah. We, um, does your dad show up? Uh, as a, you know, Would we recognize him as a character in any of your work over the years? Or, or other, other family members, for that matter? I don't. I don't think my father was in there, but uh, my a lot of my friends were. Beetle Bailey's based on my old high school buddy and uh, college roommate, mm-hmm. and uh, his name was David Hornaday, and he was a big, lanky, lazy kind of guy, and everybody liked him and everything like that. But he just, you know, kind of goofing off all the time. I remember I went by to uh, pick him up to play golf one day, and his mother said. Uh, David's still in bed. Uh, you got to go wake him up. So I went up and I shook him in bed and I said, "David, David, wake up. We got a tee off time at nine. He just grabbed his pillow, turned his back to me, and he went on sleeping. <laughs> I took his bed and I turned it upside down. He fell out on the floor and just reached out and got his pillow and went on sleeping on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "David, you ought to be in a comic strip." <laughs> so does he does he collect residuals on that? Well, he's he's dead now. Oh. But, uh, uh, he used to. They used to play him up in his paper back in St. Joseph, Missouri, all the time, on the front page. And I said, "Does it bother you?" And he says, "A little bit, but I, I like it okay." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that he would really like being compared to Beetle, but <laughs> well, you know, you're going to live on uh, in some way, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, did I read that that Lieutenant Fuzz was actually closest to you? Well, at the time, I based it on my experiences when I first became a lieutenant in the army, mm-hmm. and I was so impressed with myself, you know, being an officer, and I was only uh, uh, 19 years old at the time, and uh, so I, I kind of, using my uh, official status, you know, I walked into our sergeant's office, and it was all cluttered with. Uh, Use coffee cups and papers, and <laughs> litter on the floor, and I says, "Sergeant, let's get this place cleaned up." And he looked at me. Instead of saluting, he said, oh, "Knock it off, Lieutenant." <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of based some of my experiences of trying to trying to be an officer on Lieutenant Fuzz. I see. And uh, did you have formal uh, art training? Uh, I used to take art courses until I suddenly got the idea when I was in high school that, you know, if I was going to do a comic strip, which I really, that was my lifelong ambition to do, you know. That was what I was preparing for. And uh, I thought, you know, if if I just am an artist, I'm going to have to pay somebody to write my ideas for me. And that means I only make half as much money. <laughs> so I started taking writing courses and uh, instead of art. But uh, I, I took a couple because they were usually snap courses. I just, I'd always get an A, and that would, and I didn't have to do any homework or anything. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> but after I came to New York and started uh, uh, doing cartoons, I was the top-selling magazine cartoonist in the country uh, in 1948. After a year after I got out of college, and my art teacher in Missouri University used to hang up my drawings and say, 
an example of fine art in cartooning. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to get get some credit for me. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> They, they 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 want they want they want the credit. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, we trained that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many people that they they churned through there uh, as a result of that. So then, my uh, as opposed to that, my uh, journalism uh, school uh, claimed me as a star student in journalism. <laughs> <laughs> People living off of you all over the place. Well, I remember I was taking this writing course, and I was taking getting straight A's. I was a top student in the writing course. And the teacher asked me one day, he said, I'd like for you to come home and have dinner with me and my wife. And I said, okay. So uh, I go to dinner, and we talk about writing all through dinner, you know, the great writers we were. After dinner, he shoved his chair back, and he says, well... Uh, I guess you'd like to write the great American novel. I said, no, sir. He said, no? I said, no, I want to write the great American comic strip. <laughs> and you never saw such a look on a guy's face. <laughs> he was like I'd hit him with a brick. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you feel like um, guys who do what you do are, are, are held in more esteem today than they were 50 years ago? No, it's just the opposite. Boy, really? When I grew up, uh, the cartoonists were national heroes. Boy, they were famous. I remember going into a restaurant with Al Cap and, and Milton Kniff, mm. and everybody turned around and they said, Ah, there's Milton Kniff. Hell, he's with Al Cap. Mm. You know? uh, they were on the cover of Time magazine and uh, you know, written about all the time, and they were revered, and they were rich and famous. They used to drive around in, in the Mercedes and, you know, expensive cars and everything. They were well-respected, but, you know, you've got so many other uh, things going on for people today, you know, television and movies and things that we didn't have in those days. I remember, uh, and we've, we've, we've talked about Will Eisner before, but I, I remember Will Eisner had said that um, he wanted to rise to the level of the comic strip artist from the comic book artists because there were comic strip artists, then there were pornographers, and then there were comic book artists. <laughs> and that, that, was, that was about the way he thought that the, the, uh, the pecking order worked. Well, uh, you know, there, there was a time there when comic books were just about out of business. Yeah. And then suddenly, I don't know what, I guess it was the movies that came out with Spider-Man and Superman and everything like that that uh, revitalized the comic book business. But they were almost dead at one time. Mm. Well, speaking of almost dead, let's talk about the the newspaper business and the effect of the internet and and other things. Do, do, you know, where do you see it going? Do you think there'll be a newspaper business for cartoonists to sell their wares in five, ten years? Boy, you just don't know. I mean, I've seen so many businesses and things go out of out of business, you know, because of changes and everything is changing so rapidly these days. I don't know. If where we're going. I don't know how you can get along without newspapers. Mm. You know, maybe people aren't reading them as much as they used to, but I find I can't get along without them. You know, I've, I've got all my computers are all around here and television sets and DVDs and all that kind of stuff, but I depend on the paper to find out what's going on. Mm. I know there were circulation numbers just this past week for the major newspapers around the country. I think only three of them were up in circulation, and a even that, it was and none of them were up more than like 2%, and the rest were all down. Yeah. And that's got to be a little frightening. Well, it is, and I know that the papers are cutting back on their comics. You know, they're going from two pages to one page, and, uh, you know, they're trying to cut the cost because the owners of the papers always want to make more money. And while they're still making as much money as they did 10 years ago, just about, uh, the owners want to make more. So they, they think by cutting back on their expenses, uh, our local paper here just fired uh, 15 of its top editors and, and kind of combined its operations with another paper, with the town next to us, cutting back on their comics and everything like that. And I'm thinking, you know, if, they're, if they want to appeal to people, they ought to keep their most popular features. Uh, comics are the best read part of the newspaper. Mm. And usually, you, right after the headlines, the favorite part of the paper. 
but uh, a lot of editors don't see it. They they think their editorials are the big stars. <laughs> Little do they know. Yeah. Until you know, you know when they find out, of course. Because and my wife's an editor in a newspaper. They find out when they drop a strip and the phone starts ringing off the hook. Then they realize, oh, people do care about that stuff. I know, and but it, it takes something like that to uh, to tell them. I don't know why they they don't realize it before. But while I don't think that uh, comics should run the newspaper or anything like that, it's just you know they're very popular with people, so don't cut them out. They're, they're the things that uh, people look for. I, I should give credit where credit is due. By the way, this is this is a line of questioning that Mark Tatuli uh, from you know, Creator of Leo uh, had in mind, which I actually found interesting that he was concerned as a guy who's sold his strip into more than 300 papers in in about a year and a half. Uh, but he, nonetheless, is concerned. I guess he's wondering, you know, he's been on a, a fast rise, but I, I guess, you know, even he is concerned about how much further it can go if they're all cutting back. Yeah, I think that somebody starting out is probably going to have a more difficult time that, because the editors are not adding the strips as fast as they used to, uh, and they're just trying to hold on to the ones that, that they've got and hold on to the... To the price they're paying, I'm I'm not making any more money now than I made uh, 30 years ago mm. because they're just not raising their prices anymore. But still, Beetle is in 52 different countries in um, 1,800 newspapers, and it has a readership of 200 million every day. I mean, that's a kind of a readership that I think any writer would love to have. Sure. One of the things that one of the other things that Mark was wondering is if along that same line is if you see a future for new comic artists being able to make a living as comic strippers. Well, it's going to be more and more difficult. Yeah. Do they do they need to uh, look for other uh, uh, media like uh, the internet, for example? Do you think that you know publishing your your strips directly to the uh, to the web is going to be a way of the future? I haven't found anybody that's been able yet to figure out how to make money at it. Mm. Uh, you can put your stuff on the Internet and hope people are going to see it, but how are you going to get them to pay for it? That's, that's the big problem. Well, and I want to ask you, um, this is for me now, not for Mark. <laughs> um, I wondered what you made of the, uh, speaking of strips, that kind of mix the old, the old and the new. I, I wondered what you made of the hybridization of Lynn Johnson's uh, "For Better or Worse." You mean that she's going back to and uh, yeah. redoing her old strips? Yeah, that you can't tell from from day to day if it's a if it's a, if it's a new strip or a reprint. I mean, you can, but you don't know from day to day what you're getting. And I don't even think some of the newspapers have caught on to that yet. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to work out. I was reading it this morning, and I was trying to figure out. Uh, when that strip first appeared, probably, what, 30 years ago or something like that? Yeah. Um, she's always been an experimenter, you know. Uh, I read an editorial yesterday from the, I think, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, where the author said, what's going on with comic strips, you know? You got Doonesbury the, the writing stories about a guy who lost his leg in battle. And uh, Tom Badiak, you know, he had his... Uh, main character die of cancer. Lynn Johnson, she's got dogs dying, and she's got the old man uh, with Alzheimer's and trying to take care of. You know, uh, where's where's the funny stuff anymore? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many strips, you know, now are are dealing with uh, uh, emotional problems and, and things like that, rather than uh, making you laugh every day. Well, it's probably not unusual to find that in Doonesbury over the years, but but uh, Funky Winker being, which I hadn't seen in years, it's not carried near us, and uh, I, I read about the, 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 the character dying of cancer, and I thought, that must be kind of shocking in that strip. That, I mean, I, I've always equated that strip more along the lines of like a High and Lois or a Blondie, and that, you know, it's about people, and it's just a, you know, it's a gag a day kind of a thing, and then what, so a, a comic strip character is dying of cancer? Yeah. Wow, that's a wake-up call for people reading that strip. Yeah, well, it's it's not the tr traditional thing that you see in comic strips, you know. I like to make everybody laugh and, uh, you know, maybe enjoy the day a little bit better or something like that. Now you Laughter is a great healing uh, conduit, you know, for... 
enjoying life more. You've, uh, you know, you've gradually brought uh, family, uh, as, as did uh, Dick Brown, into, into your strips and kind of passed it along, although obviously you're still involved. In the case of Lynn uh, Johnston, though, if she, and I know she has staff, but if she's tired of doing the strip, shouldn't she just stop doing it? Or is it just too, financially, is it just too hard to walk away from, from that kind of thing? Uh, I, I think that um, I've heard some rumors about her her getting a divorce and her husband leaving her penniless. Cause, I don't know, I guess he took the money or something. I don't know. Uh, so maybe she still needs the money. Oh, so the motivation might be a little different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's sad. It was such a such a great strip for so long, but it yeah. it just seems kind of lackluster now. And you can see, it's kind of like a, there are times when Gary Trudeau has taken a couple of weeks or a few months off, and you'll see older strips run. You can just see the difference in the quality of the art and and the, the gags. And then you know what's happening. I think with for better or worse. I think it's it's unfortunate because it I don't know it it doesn't it doesn't add to the legacy of, of the strip. But yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's interesting. You know, they've been rerunning the peanut strips for a long time, and uh, it's like I'm reading them for the first time. It's, uh, you know, he and I started at the same time in 1950. Right. I started one month before he did, and we became friends and had a lot of experiences together over the years. And... uh, so it was interesting to me to go back and see his early work. And while I think he learned uh, how to draw a little bit better <laughs> than the early years, um, it's still interesting. Well, it's funny. You, you, uh, you've done a wonderful thing here. You've set me up for the last couple of questions I wanted to ask you, <laughs> which were actually were about Schultz. Um, because I, I know that you've been friends, and uh, of course he's the subject of this new book, uh, Schultz and Peanuts, by yeah. Charles Michaelis. Um, you uh, you go back obviously a long time. You nominated uh, Schultz to be a member of the National Cartoonist Society. He was rejected at first because uh, nobody knew him. I remember that there's a great story that you told you told me, and uh, I know you told uh, Michaelis. Um, what do you think of Michaelis's belief that? Uh, Schultz was largely an unhappy, perhaps clinically depressed man. I, I don't think uh, it showed up that much as far as I'm concerned. He was always a little shy, and uh, I, that's how I, I got to know him. Somebody said, there's a cartoonist that just started a strip out in Minneapolis, but he doesn't know any other cartoonist. Could you write him? So I said, sure. So I started writing him. And we began to correspond, and then I invited him to come up to New York and meet some of the cartoonists. He came up, and I put him up and, you know, gave him a place to stay. And I threw some parties for him, and he, he met everybody. He wandered around New York with looking at the big buildings and everything like that. <laughs> I, I called him a, a hayseed, which he didn't like. <laughs> but, uh, I think you called him a hayseed's hayseed. <laughs> I didn't think that was derogatory, but you know, he he took a little offense at it. But anyway, we we still remained friends, and um, then we began to sit together at, at the cartoonist meetings. He'd come up here, and we'd sit at the same table. And uh, I I got him into the cartoonist society. I just they said that you don't know him, so uh, you can't. He doesn't have any other friends, you know, so you can't really nominate him. So that's reason, one of the reasons I invited him to come up here. And I just said, look, you can't keep him out. He's got a comic strip. It's in the paper. He's a cartoonist, you know. <laughs> and so they finally let him in. And we used to sit together at all the cartoonist meetings. And then later on, uh, uh, he and I were invited to uh, hand out the yearly Rubin Award to the uh, Cartoonist of the Year. So he and I were on the stage together Mm -hmm. uh, for many years. He gave us a million dollars to help start the museum. And um, anyway, he was just a a good friend, and we were always, uh, you know, related along the way. Have you read the book? I started it, but uh, I haven't been able to, to, I haven't had the time really to get really engrossed in it. It's got to be... It's, right in front of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny, same here. 
Um, it, it's a, it's a, it really is a fascinating book, but I also wonder if it, if it gives you pause as someone who's had a very long, very successful career to think about what might be written, uh, you know, when your time comes. If, if, you know, if there's someone out there thinking, you know, I'm going to write a, a posthumous uh, biography of Mort, are there things that you worry about being written or said about you at that time? No. It, it reminds me of a biographer, and uh, somebody was asking him one day, he, all these books he's written about people, and he said, why don't you write a book about this guy? And he named somebody. And the writer said, I can't write a book about him. I don't know anything against him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would think that I've always been such a happy, uh, lucky type of uh, cheerful person and everything like that. Uh, it isn't interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, is there is there you know uh, is there anything that you hope will be written about you uh, when that time comes? Any any you know, a, play, a Playboy like to end its uh, interviews over the years with uh, you know what would you like to see on a tombstone? Final words kind of thing. Do you do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, only that uh, I probably enjoyed life more than any anybody I know. Hmm. And I always like to leave them laughing, even on the street. I'm always saying funny things to people as they walk down the street. I like little kids, and I was in the grocery store. I'm always talking to little kids, saying, uh, "Are you really a New York Yankee?" He's got his T-shirt on there. <laughs> Do you play baseball for him? <laughs> so I'm always having fun. Well, Mort, it is always a pleasure to get to talk to you, and I want to thank you again so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. Okay, Bob. Thank uh, you. Thank you. And, folks, if you'd like to uh, keep up with Mr. Media's Friday interviews, you can subscribe to the site via email at www.mrmedia.com. You can also subscribe to the audio feed in the podcast section of iTunes. Thanks for joining us. Please come back again next week for another Fridays with Mr. Media.